I think that, yes, humans can speak to force and force can speak back. Um, the question is, uh, what does it mean to speak? What does it mean to listen? Um, and um, my book was an attempt to m give one kind of an answer, uh, to say that um, there is a kind of thought available to us that um, that that is um, that just doesn't quite look like the thought that we usually think of as thought. My book, How Force Think, is based on ethnographic research. I'm an anthropologist in um, in the Amazon, in an area that was um, Equ in the Ecuadorian Amazon, uh, living with indigenous people and doing ethnography with them. That is spending a lot of time hanging out and attending to attending to what I learned from that hanging out and trying to represent that as best I can uh, through writing and other practices. So um, what I quickly realized when I was doing ethnography with these people is that it wasn't enough to sort of attend to what the people were doing, but they were uh, had to recognize that they were relating to all sorts of other beings. Some of them were visible, like animals and plants, and some of them were not so visible, uh, like spirits. And all of these beings were part of um, the forest. And I had to, I tried to very carefully follow how that relationship took place. And I realized that the best way to understand that was through understanding these relationships as communicative ones. So people obviously talk, to, talk among each other and they use language. Um, they obviously, another way to say is that people think, right? They represent the world around them, they learn from that experience. What's interesting about my ethnographic work is that once you do ethnography which, uh, with pe how people think or represent with each other, but also with others, animals, plants, and also spirits, um, then you're in another kind of domain of thought. And a lot of my work was about, was about just following that, um, often through things like tape recording, um, how is it that people talk amongst each other about forest experiences and then how, what happens when some of those forest experiences intrude. So sometimes people will be having certain conversations and a certain bird flies over, makes a call. That call is also part of the recording I made and it, um, it's a form of communication that people interpret in different ways and how they interpret it is sometimes like the way the bird communicates, sometimes unlike. Um, so I began to realize that that this was a huge problem in, in our way of thinking, Western ways of thinking, academic ways of thinking about things. And I decided to say that you know, the most important claim, it could be summarized in this idea that forests also think. That, that is, um, other kinds of entities think, not just humans. So that would be um, individuals, like you could say an individual agouti or a jaguar thinks a plant thinks, but maybe assemblages of entities which we might call a forest thinks, um, and maybe even something more general like spirits think. I use Sylvan thinking as a, as a way to, um, to talk about uh, those kinds of thinking that are not necessarily symbol-like. And um, so when we uh, use, when we represent through images, like filming, when we draw, when we dream, when we gesture, when we read emotions, our metabolism, all of those forms of being are partaking in, in a, they're representational, they're parts of the living thinking, as you were saying, um, but they're not necessarily symbolic. Sylvan thinking sort of amps up or makes apparent these elements of thought that I would like to valorize. Um, so images, Sylvan thinking uh, amps up uh, the, the property inherent to all thinking of working through images. So um, what's interesting about images, uh, likenesses, is that um, they have a certain kind of relational property. So for example, if you laugh and I laugh because you're laughing, um, your laughter is in me, but it's actually not your laughter anymore, it's my laughter. We are one because of that laughter, right? We know this. I mean, that's the essence of all sorts of forms of bonding in human groups. And we tend to think that telos, purposes, functions are things that we impose, we, wherever that mind came from, we don't know, but that we impose on the world. And what's interesting about uh, understanding life as semiotic is you can see the emergence of directedness and like means ends relationships. And yet, this is not 
a grand teleology. It's not clear. There's no sense of where it's going. It's going, but it's not clear where it's going. It's not predetermined. And one of the reasons why that is is that part of what people sometimes miss is the specific spaces of disruption of means ends relationships, uh, where that is part of the flourishing. And this is play. Um, so that's one of the, um, that's why play for me is so important. You can see this, you know, I work in tropical forests. In a sense, uh, all of that production of variation is a, is a one massive playing field. Uh, it's one great production of different thoughts about the world. Universities are like this too. Um, Try stuff out. Try see stuff out. Sticks. See what sticks. Sorry. Yeah, exactly. Try stuff out. See what th sticks. And you never know what it's going to stick to, right? Because okay. the, 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 the world changes. Part of what I'm interested in is looking at ways in which that dualism is disrupted. And one of the places, one of the ways to look at that is to look at things like semiotic life and representation as essentially um, a moment where. Uh, in the universe where absences become more important than presences. Um, so, you know, an organism is not the environment that it represents, right? Um, we who are alive are indebted to the, our ancestors who are dead, who are not here. We do things, uh, you know, by virtue of future goals that are not present. All of this sort of absential phenomena is super important. And I think that a lot of the things that when we talk about domains that are religious, or divine, or God, um, spirits, they uh, are amping ups of this kind of essential dynamics. These living dynamics produce generalities. Semiotic life produces things that we normally locate only in human minds. Forests create generalities. Living forms create generalities. A species, a lineage, um, the locus of evolution is not of the individual. It's in some other lo slightly larger domain. Those are generals. Spirits are generals. I think once you can reground symbolic thinking, which is not to kill it or to stop its our particular form of flourishing, but once you can reground it, then I think that that um, can help us live in a way that we're less disjointed from the effects we have in the world. That's one thing. The other thing is that I think that um, Sylvan thinking can suggest its own form of doing and being. Um, it, 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 for, it, it suggests another way of acting. So what is it like to live in a more absential way? Which is, I guess, a, it could also be thought of as a Buddhist question. Um, what, 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 what's that like? Um, I think that those are things that can be uh, actively thought about by thinking with thinking for us. So thinking for us is not just something that is an object to be preserved, but it's a it's an it's a form of being to relate with, in order to learn another form of relating.